Hey, before Jen and Swami get into uh, this month's case, uh, trauma fundamentals. So this is a series going through the primary survey, the secondary survey, what to do at each critical step, uh, how to put on tourniquets, how to put on uh, pelvic binders, just a whole bunch of stuff. So if you're new to trauma, this is perfect for you. And if you need a refresher, it's perfect for you. Shot in our big studio in a very different way. This is not a lecture slide format. This is way more interesting. It's already gotten a huge amount of uh, viewership. Go check it out. The new Trauma Fundamentals. We're really proud of it. And I think you're really going to enjoy it. So, back to the case. Two weeks ago, we had a segment on massive transfusion and trauma with Kenji. And we failed to mention that James Christopher Harrison, who passed away on February 17th of this year, held the record for most blood donated. Mr. Harrison rolled up his sleeve every two weeks, donating a total of 1,173 units of his blood. And that blood has been integral in making anti-D and critical in preventing RH mismatch, saving over 2 million kids. Jan, it's absolutely amazing. I, you know, I donate blood like two or three times a year. This guy was doing it every two weeks. Yeah, it's kind of hard to imagine. I read an article about him that said that he had some kind of like major chest surgery when he was a kid. And so at that time, he lost a lot of blood. And that's what sort of stimulated him to think I should give back. And so he started donating blood, not knowing that he had this magical blood that was going to save all of these people. This guy has his own Wikipedia page, and he's just a blood donor. Mm -hmm. So that shows you how important he is. They say he has the golden arm. But Swami, you know you've made it when you have your own Wikipedia page, I think. I I think that's like the ultimate yeah, yeah. these days. Absolutely. Neither of us has one as far as I know. I mean, I haven't searched. That's like a whole thing, right? Ego surfing. I have not searched to see if I have one, but I can't imagine that there'd be any reason for me to have one. But uh, maybe I'm just going to ramp up my blood donation. See if I can get all that blood out of my system. And maybe then, maybe then somebody will write a Wikipedia page about me. I always had this thought that, and I donated blood too, that it's good for you. It's good for you to donate blood to basically just challenge your bone marrow to make sure it still knows what to do if you hemorrhage, mm. right? Like just keep those stem cells, you know, on their toes so they're ready to turn it out whenever you might need it in a, in a pinch by the way only a person who lives in los angeles would think i need to challenge my bone marrow <laughs> in case i have a major trauma yes. all right but jen I, I, totally fine has nothing to do with what we're going to get into today but let's dive into the case you got a good one for us recently i was taking care of a 66 year old woman she comes in with a chief complaint of shortness of breath now she rolls in she's with a family member she looks pretty short of breath you notice right away that her respiratory rate is increased now she can talk to you she's speaking in kind of short sentences but she's working to breathe Blood pressure looks okay, heart rate in the low 100s, and the daughter is with you, and she tells you she's got some kind of a problem with her lungs. She's not exactly sure what it is, but she says it's not a heart problem, it's a lung problem. And so I want to know, Swami, knowing that, picturing this woman rolling in, what kind of questions you got for me? Of all of the vital sign abnormalities, I think tachypnea is the one that scares me the most. I think we all kind of feel that way. Tachypnea can be from so many different things, but it is always bad. And you really have to be in front of the patient looking at them and seeing that tachypnea, that air hunger, and you get a little bit anxious. So I'm already a little anxious thinking about this lady. I wish that I knew what this lung disease was. I kind of want people to always have med alert bracelets. Like these are my medical conditions. It would just obviously make all of our lives a lot easier. It's a problem with the lungs. So that's a helpful place to start, although she could have something else going on. And I hate to say it, Jan, I know it's kind of old school, but I want to listen to the lungs. And at some point, I'm probably also going to look at the lungs. So I'm probably also going to do an ultrasound and then ask those questions. Has this happened before? Is she on oxygen at home? Does she take specific medications for this lung problem? Maybe that can help me kind of back into a diagnosis. Those are all great questions. One of the other things about the power of physical exam, and I agree with you about the tachypnea. I always wonder, you know, is this a lung problem? Is it a heart problem? Is this an acidosis and it's a metabolic problem? There's so many things it could be. Um, the daughter being there was really helpful because she told us, yes, she is on home oxygen. And she even knew that normally she's on three liters so that we had that information. The other thing about the power of observation and seeing how uncomfortable someone was, was also seeing that this woman was relatively pleasant and like happy to be there, grateful for the care. She wasn't scared being, you know, meaning that this has probably happened to her before. But she also had that round face that I have seen over the mm. years from steroids. I didn't even have to really ask her if she was on prednisone. I could tell from looking at her, this is a woman who's been on chronic prednisone for a long, long time. And I think, again, the power of physical exam, don't underestimate how much information you can get from just looking at somebody. 
I think that combination of they're on HOMO2, they're on steroids, kind of pushes us towards COPD as a possible diagnosis. That's going to be the most common, but we do have to consider some other etiologies if she has some kind of an inflammatory lung disorder, you know, something a little bit unusual. But my initial thought would be, okay, maybe this is a COPD exacerbation, so I'm going to maybe put the patient on CPAP maybe give them some nebs, maybe they need a bigger dose of steroid than they usually get, or maybe we can just start by turning up the oxygen and seeing the patient's more comfortable with that while, again, we try to gather more information. Hopefully, the patient's been to your hospital. You can look in that EMR and find a little bit more information about what this lung disease is, but you are getting some more information that helps to start a evaluation and start management. So we did turn up her oxygen. we turned it from three liters to six liters. She started looking better and said she felt better. Those lungs, you asked about how they sounded, sounded like some fine crackles, kind of both sides, no real wheezing there. The ultrasound, not so revealing, didn't look like she had any kind of pulmonary edema and she didn't look swollen in terms of peripheral edema. She also was complaining of a little bit of upper quadrant pain, a little bit of gastritis maybe. She said she had some gastritis, so that was also kind of bothering her. But I want to ask you, Swami, so knowing that someone's on chronic prednisone, which she did confirm she takes chronic steroids, what does that do to your differential at this point? She doesn't have a fever. I've told you a little bit about her lung exam. She's on prednisone. So what are you thinking about a differential right now? Well, she's chronically on steroids. She's immunocompromised. So we still have to think about simple things like infection, whether that be a bacterial infection, whether it be a viral infection. It seems to have been flu season all year this year, so I'd probably be doing a swab to look for things like flu or COVID. So there's some infectious stuff that's got to be up there. If the patient doesn't really have much of a cough or fever, maybe I'm pushing away from that. Pulmonary embolism, I think, has to be considered. You know, usually you hear clear lungs with PE, but if this patient has an underlying lung disorder, then you're not really going to get that that benign exam of the lungs when you listen. So PE has to be in there. I guess you could consider things like, could this patient have a pneumothorax? Like they have COPD, they popped a bleb, and now they have a pneumothorax. I think that's up there. Even though the patient has no cardiac history, we want an EKG, make sure that we're not missing something like an MI. I'd probably start with that stuff. While again, we're trying to get a little bit more information about what this underlying lung disease is. Absolutely. So I agree with all those things. We ordered the chest x-ray, the EKG, some labs, et cetera. And so I start to dig dig in with the daughter as to what other medications she's taking. And she keeps saying this word that I don't recognize. And she says, OFEV. And I'm like, I I don't know what that is. What is it? OFEV. What? I, I've just never, what, what is that a is that an inhaler is that a is that a IV infusion what is this medication, so she just keeps saying it so I go to the computer and I look it up O F E V this is a trade name it's a brand name for a drug called nintedanib nintedanib I've never heard of this drug I've never seen this mm, drug nope. this is a drug I'm completely not familiar with which is one of those scenarios when you find yourself in it you're like what the hell is this medication what is it for what does it do what are the side effects. Have you ever been in that situation? I'm sure you have. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, the patient's like, oh, I'm on OFEV. And you're like, oh, yeah, right, sure. And they're like, do you know what that's for? And I'm like, of course I know what it's for. (laughs) And then you're like madly looking on the computer to try and figure it out. But it's a pretty uncommon drug if neither of us have ever heard of this, which means when I look it up on the computer, it's probably going to tell me exactly what it's for. And I'm going to know what this patient's underlying lung disease is. So there's, there's a benefit to having these kind of rare drugs that patients can be on much more likely I figure out what the patient's disease is. So did this tell you like OFEV is this and it's used only for this disease? And then you're like, great, I know what's going on now. Yes. So this drug is an anti-fibrosis drug and it's indicated for pulmonary fibrosis and other diseases that fibrose the lungs. So systemic sclerosis, which is also known as scleroderma, if they have lung involvement, this drug is an anti tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It inhibits fibroblast proliferation. There's another drug in this category as well. These are super expensive drugs. Um, I looked it up. One year of therapy with these drugs costs 96000 US dollars. So this is an extremely expensive drug, which is probably why I had never heard of it in my county emergency department. Um, but that was uh, that was pretty amazing when I looked up the cost. Because like, what, why have I not heard of this drug? I do see some pulmonary fibrosis patients And then when I saw the cost, I knew why. One of the things that you can kind of glean from this is that this patient is probably pretty well taken care of. She's probably got a bunch of specialists who take care of her pulmonary fibrosis. 
And again, this kind of makes sense with her presentation. She's chronically on steroids. She is on HOMO2. Now she's more short of breath. And you're like, okay, so could this simply be a worsening of her pulmonary fibrosis? Could it be an infectious process? And one of the things, usually when we hear fibrosis, it usually means non-reversible. So a lot of those things that we were thinking about in COPD, like, oh, maybe I'll throw some beta agonist at this patient, probably not going to do very much. Hopefully the oxygen has helped. Probably you're going to give this patient some increased steroid dose. So hopefully that will help. And that's kind of where you're going to start. And then maybe try to get in touch with the pulmonary fibrosis clinic that she goes to or the pulmonologist she goes to, to see if you can get a little bit more information and figure out a little bit more about what is going on and, and how it should be treated. But I probably, Jan, would be considering high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation, depending on how sick she looked, stress dose steroids, and then trying to get more information and hoping, hoping that that's enough to get her stabilized. That all sounds great. And as I sat at the computer learning more about this drug, this nintetinib, it's an oral medication, interestingly enough. And the papers that um, came out to show its efficacy really just showed that it helps slow the decline in lung function. So it improved their FEV, you know, those measures of those pulmonary function tests didn't really change mortality, didn't even really change necessarily quality of life as they went through their course. But it helped like slow the decline in the lung function, which was as good as it gets. I I mean, honestly, I'll, I'll tell you when I saw that there was a drug for pulmonary fibrosis that would slow the decline of lung function, slow the fibrosing, I was pretty excited because this was a, a disease that I've always learned is basically fatal. It's pretty bad. This The fibroblasts just destroy your lungs. There's not much we can do to slow it down. And, you know, to see that there's actually a new drug to maybe slow it down and help it was kind of exciting. And I just started looking around about the drug, trying to read about the side effects and what it might be doing. And I found myself sitting at that computer for a very long time. <laughs> and sort of forgetting about the patient who was sitting behind me, you know, with their oxygen cranked up. And I think that it's easy for us to sometimes, you know, go on one of these deep dives in front of a computer, you know, at, maybe a little bit at the expense of a patient when you're just sort of forgetting about what they're there for, right? You're not, you're not thinking about the big picture. You're Absolutely. thinking about this exciting new drug that you're learning about because we love learning. Right, right. right. But you also want to know those side effects because maybe the patient is having a side effect from the med. You know, the other day I had a patient who came in who was on one of these MAB drugs for their cancer and they came in with a pulmonary process and we were kind of like, I'm not sure this has been going on for a while. Is it this? Is it that? And then you look up the drug and you're like, oh, the drug can cause pneumonitis and pulmonary fibrosis. Perhaps that's what's going on for this patient. So you really do kind of need that information. It can be very helpful, but you're right. This is a good place to kind of like you stay in the room with the patient. And you send another person in your team off to like do some research on the drug and then come back and tell everybody about it. But you're right. It's easy to kind of lose track of the patient. But again, I'm hoping that once you gave the patient a little oxygen, they felt a little bit better and you had a little bit more time to do that deep dive and to do the rest of that workup, get a chest x-ray, get some labs, and maybe all of that pushed you towards a diagnosis. Absolutely. So I'll just see the two headlines in terms of what to know about this drug besides what I've just told you is also one, it can bump your LFTs, it can give you an acute liver injury. So that's something you should check. And number two is that it gives a lot of GI side effects. So the most common reason people Ooh. stop it is because of diarrhea or nausea. And this woman did have some left upper quadrant pain. Right. So that right. kind of may be tied into it a little bit. But backing up and back to the patient, exactly what you said, she did feel better with some oxygen. The chest x-ray looked clear. I didn't see any pneumonia there. Um, and the labs, including her LFTs, all looked okay as well. So we weren't exactly sure what was going on. We thought it could be a PE that was still in our di differential. So we sent a D-dimer. We certainly were planning on admitting this woman, being that she had a new increased oxygen requirement that seemed to be sustained. We weren't exactly sure why. So she was going to need some observation at the least. This isn't a patient that you're likely to send home just with doubled an oxygen requirement and not sure why. So we're going to bring her in for those specialty consultations. So there wasn't anything that seemed immediate. We also were going to, of course, we were going to cover her for pneumonia even though like we didn't see objective evidence because she does have this new oxygen requirement. She is immunosuppressed. She's on steroids, as you mentioned. So better be safe than sorry in that, you know, in that scenario. Um, so we did cover her with some antibiotics as well. But um, that, you know, I think that for me, this case was an interesting one. It'd been a while since I had encountered a drug I had never heard of before. It was interesting to me how sucked into it I got and how interested I was in it, how interested I continued to be even after the shift, thinking about this new medication and wanting to learn more. And then also thinking about the health inequity side of this, which is to say that, you know, it was surprising to me working in a county system that um, this patient was on this very expensive medication. As you said, many 
these patients who are on these types of medications are very plugged into specialty centers, likely a transplant center. That might be why she was referred to sort of the, you know, um, a, a specialized center in town that does this kind of medication treatment and considers people's for transplants. But I just want to, you know, point out again that we want to make sure that all of our patients have access to these wonderful medications if it's going to help them. Um, and I was happy to see that this woman had found her way to have access to this medication. Absolutely. The other thing that I kind of take home from this, Jen, as well, is, you know, often patients don't know the name of the disease that they have. They know some generalities about it. And something like pulmonary fibrosis or this patient had scleroderma, those can be hard words to remember. It's good for us to remind our patients, hey, let's make a list of your medications and a list of your diseases. Take a picture with your phone. Put that little piece of paper in your wallet or in your purse or whatever you travel with so you always have it. And you can just be like, here. And when I have patients that come in and they're like, oh, sorry, I have like this piece of paper that has all the information. I'm like, oh my God, thank you so much. This makes my life so much easier. And yes, of course, you know, we're not taking care of these patients primarily. We don't see them frequently, but I just kind of remind my patients all the time. Like, it's great that you have that. Make sure you always do take a picture of it, send the picture to a family member. Maybe they can text it to me in those circumstances, but it's really hard to know how to take care of the patient if you don't know what the underlying disease is. This is a place where we can really help each other by helping the patient to have that information. So um, I try to remind patients of this all the time, to have that, the ECG, if they come into the emergency department, I give them a copy of their ECG before they go home. So they have that that they can keep as well. I think all of this can be really beneficial until we have a universal EMR that we can all access. Uh, wouldn't that be a dream? It just, I, it's gotta happen. I want it to happen in our lifetime though, Swami. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could see uh, the patient information be. on my coast and I could see it on your coast and no more fax machines. I mean, we're still faxing things back and forth, which That's is- unbelievable. Nuts. Well, if you work at the VA, we have that magic, right? I mean, whether you're at the VA in California or we have the VA in New Jersey, I can access all your records. I can see all of the diseases, all the specialists who take care of you, but we all deserve to have that kind of an EMR. But that's an aside, Jan. That's not really about this patient or about this particular drug or this disorder, but it is really interesting to hear about these new treatments, new things that are out there. It keeps us challenged, keeps us on our toes. So we kind of have to continue to read and be educated by our patients, sometimes by the consultants who know a little bit more about these diseases as well. It's a good case, Jen. I think it is far too common that we see these kind of things where we're just kind of left with, I don't know what that drug is. Should I know what that drug is? I hope somebody knows. And, and of course, if you just had a clinical pharmacist, Jen, all of this would be fixed. Yeah, that is very true. I, I, You know, it's funny that I didn't even call the ED pharmacist in this particular case because I just wanted to learn about it myself. And, you know, I just mm. was, you know, it's just, that's the kind of thing you just go to the computer and start reading for yourself. And the, the air of self-directed learning, I encourage everyone to do the same, but you're right. Pharmacists are a great resource. And was she was very excited when I told her that we had a patient on this drug. She's like, oh, I've read about that drug. Yeah, we don't use that down here, but that's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, Shan, let's talk about what we have on tap this week. Almost back with Cardiology Corner, answering a bunch of questions from the listeners. We got a little bit of a twofer with Amal because Amal also sat down with Mike Weinstock to do the second part of our risk management series on MRAP. So we got a lot of Amal on tap for the week. But before we get to Amal, let's dive into some papers from last month's EMA. <laughs> 